So, Sony recently released the game list for the PlayStation Classic. And while I don't usually cover current news or give my opinion on current happenings, considering it's the PlayStation 1, I thought I would give my take on the PlayStation Classic. I've seen a lot of negativity on the PlayStation Classic, and for good reason. The game selection is questionable, leaving out some games that everyone thought would be no-brainers, and choosing some that have gamers scratching their heads as to why. Cost-cutting measures like not including dual analog controllers and using an open-source emulator instead of optimizing one of their own in-house emulators to run the games. And I've even seen some people complain about other nitpicky things like lack of filters and, well, the menu screen, including the font. Honey, look at this menu screen. Get your purse. We are taking this system back said no one who ever bought a plug-and-play console, and other complaints about early 3D graphics and control schemes. I will go through my thoughts on each individual game included on the PlayStation Classic later, and am not going to defend every choice made. But I will say that I understand the difficulty of choosing 20 PlayStation-defining games, considering the PS1's library was so vast, and had every kind of game for every kind of gamer. Fighting games, platformers, RPGs, third-person action games, action-adventure games, puzzle games, and etc. Like any top console of its generation, there are so many games and no two gamers had the exact same experience with the console, which had such a wide appeal to every kind of gamer. The other huge difficulty I would say for releasing a PlayStation Classic versus a Nintendo or Sega one has to do with first-party games versus third-party games. Make a list of 20 defining NES, Super NES, N64, Sega Genesis, Saturn, Dreamcast, or Master System games, and chances are the majority of the defining games on that list are going to be first-party Sega and Nintendo games. For the original PlayStation, you would probably find the exact opposite, as most of the defining games for the system were third-party efforts. Sony's first-party efforts were mostly just there. Not that some of Sony's first-party games weren't quality, and they did smartly acquire strong franchises like Twisted Metal and Wipeout, and eventually they did release games like Gran Turismo and Legend of Dragoon, but the overwhelming percentage of games most gamers would consider to be system-defining games came from second- and third-party efforts. It wasn't until the PS2 that Sony's first-party development teams became what I would consider to be some of the best in the industry. If Sony releases a PS2 classic in the future, there are more likely to be a much higher percentage of first-party Sony games in that list. I guess my point is that due to the lack of strong first-party games on the PS1, it's more of an up-in-the-air choice for those 20 games. Whereas Nintendo or Sega would have a lot more Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, and Sonic to add to a similar system. My predictions, should there ever be an N64 classic, which from what I hear there might not be, they are mostly going to be Nintendo first-party games, maybe Perfect Dark, probably not GoldenEye, and maybe one of the five third-party N64 releases that ever graced that system. Is five too high a number? Some of the complaints I've seen seem to deal with early 3D graphics not holding up, the lack of filter options, and early 3D control schemes. Maybe I'm not the best to comment on early graphics or the control schemes because I never stopped playing PS1 games. PS2 came out, I still played PS1 games alongside it. The PS3 came out, and I still played PS1 games. With very little gaps in play, I have played PS1 games since 1997, so I still have an eye for its graphics in the context of the games released at the time, and my tank control scheme skills never dissipated. At one point, I almost yearly played through Tomb Raider. The complaint about the lack of filters is kind of a moot point for me, but I can understand people wanting an array of options to soften the graphics. Even the PS3 had a smoothing filter for PS1 games, and the PS2 allows for bilinear texture filtering in PS1 games. 
However, these are early 3D graphics and there's not many ways to improve them. They are a product of their era. It seems, at least with those who have played the PS1 Classic, their complaints seem to be with the fact that these are early 3D graphics and not really about any filtering options. To me, the real beauty of early 3D graphics is seeing what developers were able to pull off visually and engine-wise when developers weren't able to pull off anything they wanted. It's fun to see what tricks they had to use in order to get a game to run right, and how some of those tricks added to the atmosphere of the game. How does one simulate a big 3D world on a system that can't render a big 3D world? You may not appreciate the visual quality of early 3D games, but there are still things in these games that can be appreciated, like art direction, atmosphere, and smoothness of the gameplay. Or lack thereof. For the complaints about the controls, this one is understandable. If you are used to modern control schemes, there is going to be an extremely high learning curve for early 3D control schemes, especially in games like Siphon Filter and Resident Evil. If you are too young to remember this era, try putting yourself in our place, coming out of the 2D era of gaming and into the 3D era. This was an entire generation of learning everything. Imagine if gaming completely changed overnight and there was a whole new dimension to explore in games. Whole new kinds of level designs and mechanics to learn. New exploration mechanics were added to 3D games. New environmental puzzles to solve. Learning about atmospheric design choices and how atmosphere can draw you in as easily as level designs. And whole new genres of games were created out of nowhere at the beginning of the 3D gaming era. This was a brand new era and everything was new and experimental. The advent of 3D technology in gaming and the experimental atmosphere that came with it also brought with it early experimental control schemes for gamers to learn in a brand new era of gaming. This was a generation of experimental games being developed and a generation of learning new control schemes for gamers at large. Not only did we have to learn new design elements in the games, but also new control schemes with which to play these new games. There really hasn't been another era like this in gaming since the early advent of video games themselves, and the 3D era is sort of a second advent in gaming a time gaming will never see again. Looking back, yes, some of these control schemes are rough and very hard to get a handle on if you are used to today's control schemes. The design elements are all taken for granted now, but the controls aren't. In all honesty, I would say that gamers going back have a lot less to learn about these games than we did looking forward. Plus, if you spent any long periods of your life playing any of these games, Give it some time, muscle memory will kick in. It should eventually click. You'll find your fingers doing it without you even realizing it. The final complaint, and probably the most valid, is in the games that we all wanted on the system, but that weren't added. Games like Crash, Spyro, Symphony, and even Tomb Raider, which if you are having trouble controlling Gabe Logan or Resident Evil, you would have no chance of getting even halfway through the first level in Tomb Raider, by the way. I guess we just have to take it or leave it for what it is, even if some of the choices have us scratching our heads. So with that, here is my take on the games included on the PlayStation Classic. Battle Arena Toshinden I understand why people are questioning Toshinden's addition to the PlayStation Classic lineup as this game has hardly aged gracefully. The game is far from fluid feeling, coming off as a bit sluggish. The controls, even when playing on original hardware, also lack the feel of fluidity, and the camera can be a bit troublesome in keeping up on the action, especially after the sidestep maneuver. The game is far from unplayable for an early 3D fighter, it just lacks the polish and fluidity of later fighters. For a weapons based fighter, I much rather would have seen Soul Blade on here as a precursor to the Soul Calibur series, or even rival schools, 
which has the combination Street Fighter special attacks gameplay in 3D environments. However, from a historical standpoint, I can appreciate Toshinden's addition to the game lineup. I remember hearing or seeing a quote from I believe Bernie Stoller, but don't quote me on it in case this was a different Sony exec, where he said that he wanted a 3D fighter ready for the North American launch of the PlayStation in order to go head to head with Virtua Fighter on the Saturn, and that he specifically searched out and found Toshinden to be the game to upstage Virtua Fighter, like they did in pitting Ridge Racer against Daytona USA. And upstage Virtua Fighter it did, at least in the gaming media at the time, with magazines like Game Players giving Toshinden front page coverage and declaring it the best brawler of all time, and even giving it the nod over Virtua Fighter in a full page comparison between the two, saying, and I quote, if Virtua Fighter has any advantage over Toshinden, in parentheses, which we don't think it does, it is the realistic fighting. The verdict on Virtua Fighter is that it just doesn't compare to Toshinden. End quote. Or in other words, never underestimate the power of good graphics to hype up and jack up review scores. It also didn't help that the Saturn port of Virtua Fighter wasn't arcade perfect in itself, but going back and playing both, Virtua Fighter is worlds better if not dated, and Toshinden playable, not awful, but holds up a lot worse than Virtua Fighter. However, for history's sake and for being that game that upstaged Sega's classic, I can appreciate Toshinden's addition to the PlayStation Classic. Far from Soul Blade or Tekken 3 quality, but still historically important nonetheless. Cool Borders 2 Ideally, this is the slot that should have had a Tony Hawk game in it, but I can imagine that relicensing Tony Hawk or Tony Hawk 2 would be difficult and possibly pricey. Not only would you have to license the likeness of all the skaters in the game, the game itself, but also all the music in the game. If Sony was trying to keep costs down, it seems logical that they would go with another extreme sports game that was easier for them to license. For the time, Cool Borders 2, even after its sequels came out, was a fan favorite in the series. I'm not exactly sure why. I own Cool Borders 2, 3, and 4, but haven't played any of them in depth, playing the demo disc version of Cool Borders 3 the most. I'm far from an expert as to why, but it makes sense to put the fan favorite version in the series on the PlayStation Classic and especially if Sony was trying to fill the extreme sports slot, and would have had difficulty acquiring the Tony Hawk license. Tony Hawk 2 would have been the ideal game to add, but Cool Borders 2 is what they had to work with. Not a horrible replacement, but it's understandable that gamers would rather have seen Tony Hawk instead of Cool Borders 2. Destruction Derby I don't own the original Destruction Derby, so take this footage of Destruction Derby 2 as a reference. My only real experience with Destruction Derby comes from playing the N64 version of the game at a friend's house years ago. As for early PlayStation games, Destruction Derby was always spoken highly of by those who played it. But I have had very little experience with the whole series and have barely even played the second one. In fact, I think this footage is the first time I've ever even popped it in a system. For an early PS1 standout game, I understand why they would put this one on here. It's not just a racing game, but also has the super hectic destruction derby mode. Sort of a deathmatch mode, if you will. The only point I want to make on this one, though, is that in the coverage of the PlayStation Classic, I have seen people who keep labeling this as a Psygnosis game, but they're wrong published by Psygnosis, but actually developed by Reflections, who would later go on to make Driver, which would have been a better choice for the classic than Destruction Derby, as it had a much larger effect on gaming and is easily associated with the PS1. I remember when Driver came out, people were wanting to do GTA-style things in its fully 3D environments. In many ways, Driver was a precursor to the modern GTA franchise. After Grand Theft Auto 3 came out on the PS2, the sales of Driver 2 on the PlayStation 1 skyrocketed back into the top 20 best-selling list, 
because for those who didn't own a PS2 yet, because it was still in those transition years, it was the closest thing to GTA 3 on the PlayStation 1. I will say this though, I really dig the music in Destruction Derby 2, so if the original has good music on it like the second one, I think that's worth putting it on the PlayStation Classic alone. Even if Driver totally would have been the one that they should have put on here instead. Final Fantasy 7. This is a great addition and an obvious PlayStation defining game. Final Fantasy 7 is the reason my brother and I ever bought a PlayStation to begin with as we were huge fans of Final Fantasy 3 on the Super Nintendo. Well, Final Fantasy 6 that is technically. As overrated as I have come to see Final Fantasy 7 as the years have gone by, a recent playthrough of this game made me remember how much I still loved this game. What Super Mario 64 was to platformers, Final Fantasy 7 was to RPGs. This was THE next generation RPG. It set new standards for cinematic storytelling with its use of cutscenes, something that Square was hinting at in games like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI but couldn't do due to the hardware. Prior to Final Fantasy VII, we had never seen anything like it. It was a surreal game that just felt so weird to me at the time. It was just so different from any of the 16-bit RPGs I had played. It set the standard for all RPGs to follow, brought RPGs into the mainstream allowing for a ton of other RPGs to be localized out of Japan, thus giving the PS1 arguably the greatest library of RPGs of any console ever, and it has left its lasting effect on gaming to this day. My love of Final Fantasy VI and other great RPGs compels me to consider Final Fantasy VII overrated, and I will say that it was also surpassed by other RPGs within the same generation on the same system. But nonetheless, I cannot deny that Final Fantasy VII changed gaming, and is without a doubt the next generation RPG of the 3D era of gaming. Gameplay and story-wise, overrated, but overall effect on the market and gaming in general, rightfully spoken of with high regard. I'm probably not articulating my points well, but it's one of those things where if you weren't there to see that jump from 2D to 3D gaming, it's a hard feeling to describe. And Final Fantasy VII was without a doubt the first real next generation RPG of the 3D era. All those prior, like Wild Arms, Beyond the Beyond, and Suikuden, were just repackaged 16-bit RPGs with some polygons thrown in instead of sprites. Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto 2 footage shown for reference, as I don't own the original GTA. GTA's addition here is what I would call a case of reverse popularity. It wasn't until the third game that the series became massively popular, and games like Driver were a lot more popular at the time. I think I only remember one or two kids talking about this game in high school. The series was known but it reviewed poorly and wasn't even close to what it would become. However, since GTA is one of the biggest game franchises in history now, it's understandable why Sony added the original to the PlayStation Classic. As for the gameplay, I have played the original but only own the second one. With the top-down view and the general feel of these games, I did have a lot of fun starting a game, putting in cheats, going on long murder streaks, getting bored, putting the game on a shelf, then later pulling the game back out, putting in cheats, going on long murder streaks, getting bored, and rinse and repeat. 
I don't even remember completing a single mission in the original GTA games because who actually played the missions? Fun game, but definitely not as good as later games in the series. For me, this is a so-so addition to the game lineup. I could have taken it or leaven it. Intelligent Cube This is another game that has eluded me despite wanting it for over two decades. I'm playing this footage from a demo disc, and from the demo I can tell you this is an addictive game. The advent of the 3D era brought a new dimension, if you will, to puzzle games. Games like Tetrisphere, Wet Tricks, Devil Dice, and Intelligent Cube help bring the genre beyond the mere good old school Tetris clone, and opened us up to new ideas of what could be done in puzzle games in general. I know that the Japanese version of the classic is getting Devil Dice, which would have been a great addition to the North American version, but Devil Dice is best enjoyed with a multi-tap in my opinion, 5 player crazy deathmatch, well, 5 player mode. I appreciate the inclusion of Intelligent Cube on this collection, because I don't own it. And while not the most expensive PS1 game is still pricey to pick up a disc copy of. Intelligent Cube is another selling point for me because I've wanted it for over two decades. Jumping Flash This is another good addition to the game lineup. A first-person 3D platformer that came out before Super Mario 64. The best part of the game is the fact that Robert can jump for what feels like a mile in the air in order to drop down on your enemies from above or to reach new areas of the stage. The movement and feeling of falling in your gut is the best part of this game. If you've never played a Jumping Flash game, you've never quite played anything like it. That being said, when I did my review for this game, I played through it three or four times and realized that my average playthrough of the game was around 40 to 45 minutes, give or take. The game is also pretty simplistic in its level objectives. This is a 3D platformer that isn't nearly as complex a game as the aforementioned Super Mario 64. Basically, all Robert does throughout the game is play two level stages where he hunts down three or four carrots in each stage and then finds the exit, and on the third stage he fights a boss. Very simplistic design, and there are also some first-person shooter elements and level designs as well. Still a really fun, but very short and simplistic game. It's an extremely sensitive covert operation. You'll be one man against an entire squad of high-tech special ops. If you want to survive, you got to have brains. You have to be in peak physical condition. The fate of the free world is in your hands, soldier. Failure is not an option. Sir, aren't these tests kind of easy? Suicide mission. Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid. So if Konami isn't forking over the rights to Symphony, a game that has become more popular in hindsight through word of mouth and gamers spreading the word, the one absolutely required game that needed to be on here was the PS1's biggest, most hyped game of 1998. While Symphony gained in popularity over time, Metal Gear Solid came out to huge hype and immense popularity and fanfare, and has remained as popular ever since. And rightfully so, because it is easily one of the best games on the PS1. The lack of Symphony sucks, but if there were no Metal Gear Solid, Sony shouldn't even bother releasing a PlayStation Classic. This is the number one most required game for this collection. I don't really need to go in depth on this one, so I'll just address a couple of small complaints people have with playing it on the classic, specifically with the Psycho Mantis fight in mind. People complain that with the lack of DualShock support, Psycho Mantis won't move your controller by itself which is a cool touch, but really a small detail. And since I went almost the entirety of the PS1's lifetime without a DualShock controller, using just D-pad controllers, I don't remember this part fondly. I didn't hear anyone complain that he also won't read your memory card and tell you that you like Suic Cotton or Castlevania, don't you? Ah, I can see into your mind. 
You're like Sui Coden. You're like Castlevania, don't you? The whole rest of the game is intact though. These are cool little easter eggs that do add to the experience, but they aren't something required. The only part of the cool interactive Kojima design choices made for the game that might hinder the game is when Baker tells Snake to get in contact with Meryl for the first time. And he says something along the lines of, wasn't her codec number on the back of the box? Sure enough, if you own a disc copy of Metal Gear Solid, look on the back of the jewel case and you will see a screenshot of Meryl's codec number. I think that is one of my favorite easter eggs in the game. No worries though, if it went over your head back in the day or you don't have the jewel case, Meryl does eventually call Snake if you don't contact her first. I like you. I have no name. Mr. Driller this is one that I don't actually own, but I've had on my PlayStation want list since it first came out. I actually haven't even played this one despite wanting to, so for me this is a good addition. This is another game on the list that has people scratching their heads, and yeah, maybe Devil Dice would have been a better choice for this slot, it's actually on the Japanese PlayStation Classic after all, because most people are more aware of Mr. Driller on the Game Boy Advance than on the PS1. Or maybe it's the dual screen, I'm not sure which system it released on. That tells me that this game was an underrated slash hidden gem on the PS1, because the lack of awareness about it. But I already knew it wasn't well known. This is a good addition for me because I've wanted to play it for years, but understandably why people don't quite understand why this game was put on the list. Oddworld, Abe's Odyssey. Oddworld is a really fun pre-rendered 2D side-scroller that its own cover describes as no menu, no inventory bars, no scorekeeping. Just infinite lives, victims to rescue, and inexplicably challenging gameplay. Abe is challenged with saving all 99 Mudokin slaves in the game, brain-racking puzzle solving, tough platforming elements, deep level exploration to find hidden areas which contain more Mudokins to rescue, and finding ways to either sneak past or kill enemies in the game, all set in a dark, futuristic, corporate-controlled alien world. Oddworld's core gameplay mechanics mirror games like Prince of Persia and Flashback. The story elements are told through oftentimes humorous cutscenes to show that this is a serious game that doesn't take itself too seriously. And its main gameplay mechanic focuses on the game speak feature, where through controller commands Abe can get his Mudokin buddies to follow him so he can take them to a teleport point and rescue them. Abe can also possess his enemy and find very creative ways to dispatch of them. For a 2D game, the world is interesting, humorous, brutally hard, and makes for a spectacular game. I think this is a great addition to the PlayStation Classic. <laughs> Rayman. Rayman is a game that I have owned for a number of years but still really haven't gotten around to playing it much. Beautiful 2D sprites and solid gameplay, Rayman shows the best elements of 16-bit side-scrollers with the power of the next generation of technology. A lot of people are scratching their heads over this one, citing games like Klonoa or Toomba, or Toombi if you're in the PAL territories, as better games for the collection. But Rayman was more popular and is still a solid addition to the collection. I do like Toomba and Klonoa better, but Rayman has more of a mainstream appeal and is still a good 2D platformer, from the small portions I have actually played of it, that is. Resident Evil Director's Cut I know I'm in the small minority here that actually appreciates the inclusion of Director's Cut over Resident Evil 2. I've always liked the original the best out of the entire series. My brother and I loved Resident Evil enough when we rented it that we actually bought Resident Evil 2 the very day it came out. It was actually the very fifth game I ever owned for the PlayStation and the only game I remember buying day one. 
For me, the atmosphere of the original is the best in the series. The strange feeling of being stranded in a huge mansion out in the middle of nowhere and having no escape has always left a deeper impression of fear on me than Resident Evil 2's more action slash jump scare focus. Everything was just creepier in the original, and the mansion setting made sense for having obscure puzzle solving elements in the game. Mansions have a mystique about them, trap doors, secret tunnels, needing to find and use various keys to unlock new doors, long since hidden by people who have been forgotten, in a mansion that time seems to have also forgotten. I just like the whole setting and design of the original better. Yes, dog through a window, most memorable jump scare in gaming history. But the entire setting and atmosphere of the original was not only more believable in the puzzle elements, but was just overall more eerie all throughout the game for me. Resident Evil 2 was just kind of meh to me. I played through it a couple of times, put it on the shelf, and actually haven't played through it in about 20 years. I lost complete interest in the series after the second, though I do like to play it with action replay codes, giving me the heavier guns with infinite ammo. It totally changes the entire game from a survival horror game to a zombie action game, and with the heavier action focus of Resident Evil 2 is a more fun way to play through the game for me. Seriously, if you have the option, try it this way. I appreciate the inclusion of Director's Cut on the PlayStation Classic over its sequel. Overall, I believe the atmosphere is just way better and it keeps you on the edge the whole game. Whereas Resident Evil 2 relied too heavily on cheap scares and a heavier action focus that made the puzzle element seem out of place in the game. I've never really been a huge fan of Resident Evil 2 despite owning it from day one. Revelations Persona I own nearly 50 RPGs for the PlayStation, but my RPG collection does have some glaring, expensive omissions from it. Tales of Destiny 2, Vanguard Bandits, Ark the Lad Collection, Ogre Battle, Tactics Ogre, Valkyrie Profile, and yes, the Persona series to name a few. So honestly, I'm glad to see this game on the collection because that gives me a cheaper alternative way to play it. This is another case of reverse popularity as the series has become more popular in recent years than it ever was on the PlayStation, but one that works in my favor because this is one of those glaring omissions. This is actually a selling point on the PlayStation Classic to me personally, even if its inclusion has left other gamers scratching their heads as to why. Ridge Racer Type 4 while the Ridge Racer series definitely has its history rooted in the PS1 in particular, I see R4 as the Gran Turismo stand-in game. Due to the no doubt difficulties there would be in relicensing all the cars in Gran Turismo or Gran Turismo 2. However, there were magazines at the time like PSM that actually gave R4 the nod over Gran Turismo 2 as the best racing game on the system. If you haven't played it, think of R4 as the arcade equivalent to Gran Turismo. It lacks the customization and depth of Gran Turismo and the sim feel, but it makes up for it with over 300 unlockable cars, buttery smooth arcade racing gameplay, and probably the best looking graphics in any PS1 racing game. That part might be debatable, but what isn't debatable is that R4 is at the top tier of PS1 graphics for its genre. From visuals, gameplay, and smoothness, this is a game that was considered to be on the same level of Gran Turismo 2, and considering its uniquely arcadey feel over sim feel, might even have aged a little better than GT2 as well. Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo! This one definitely has a lot of people scratching their heads as to why Sony included this game as opposed to an actual 2D Capcom fighter like Alpha 3 and that's actually completely understandable. Most people would have preferred to see Alpha 3 as it is one of the best fighters on the system. All that being said, I have heard a lot of other videos on the subject of the PlayStation Classic say they consider this to be more of an arcade game over a PlayStation game. But personally, I've never seen an arcade cabinet of Puzzle Fighter, never played the Saturn version, and quite frankly, most people didn't even know about this game when it hit or in the years after. 
puzzle games really weren't mainstream popular at the time, and most of the PS1's puzzle games went unnoticed by gamers at large. Quite frankly, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo is what you would call an underrated or hidden gem. It flew completely under the radar when it was released, and has remained there ever since. I say this is a good addition, maybe not a PlayStation-defining game, but an addictive one and a good multiplayer game. Let's also not forget about the second controller included in the PlayStation Classic. The arcade mode is fun, the street puzzle mode is brutally difficult. This is an underrated gem, where you actually build gems in the gameplay. Siphon Filter. I've heard some other channels say that with the inclusion of Metal Gear Solid, Siphon Filter's edition is kind of moot. The only two similarities between Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter are the third person camera angles and Siphon Filter occasionally has some stealth scenes. That's really the only two similarities between these two vastly different games. Whereas Metal Gear Solid unravels a much deeper story largely through long codec conversations, Siphon Filter tries to put players in the middle of the story as it's happening. Metal Gear Solid is telling a larger, deeper story over the course of the game, whereas Siphon Filter aims to put players in the middle of an action thriller movie. New changes to the plot and new objectives are radioed into Gabe in simulated real-time mid-missions. The gunplay is fast, frantic, and fun, and the early missions especially are just go, go, go. The game throws you into the action and keeps you running. They even modeled Gabe Logan after a young Alec Baldwin. Raspy voice and all. The voice acting is, at best, decent for the time. The star of the show that sets Siphon Filter apart is definitely the gunplay mechanics. Gabe has three aiming modes. He automatically auto-aims, he can zoom into first-person view for precision aiming, which controls surprisingly well with the D-pad, and the most fun one, he can lock onto enemies and eight-way run around them while shooting them, allowing Gabe to run in one direction while shooting in another. This mechanic works so well that you actually won't miss dual analog aiming in this game. The gunplay is fantastic, and it's the best part of the game. Adding dual analog aiming in the PS2 games kind of ruined the gameplay for me. My personal opinion is that the best Siphon Filter games were on the PS1 for sure. The series actually hasn't even been relevant since, either. again, didn't you? There are games, and then there's Tekken 3. PlayStation. Tekken 3. Tekken 3 is another obvious no-brainer. Easily voted the best fighting game on the PlayStation by pretty much every gaming magazine and website of its day, and is a fast, extremely fun 3D fighter. To me, this is the pinnacle of the Tekken series, though I think I like Tekken Tag a little better because it has more characters, and was actually the last Tekken game I actually spent any amount of time with. Seriously. Though I say I like Rival Schools and Soul Blade better on the PS1, I still poured an absurd amount of hours into Tekken 3 back in the day. Depth-wise, definitely below Virtua Fighter, but certainly above Dead or Alive. Tekken 3 is more easily accessible to new players, it treads that line between being easy to pick up and play for newbies, and having enough depth of play for fighting game fanatics to master. 
especially when it comes to the crazy 10 hit combos. Easy playability with a lot of depth under the surface, a bunch of unlockable characters and extra modes like Tekken Force and Tekken Ball, and a fun, smooth running play engine. Tekken 3 is easily one of the best 3D fighters on the system and a high ranker for one of the greatest of all time. Great game. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. Rainbow Six Rogue Spear shown here for reference. This is the biggest head scratcher of the entire collection. Of all the D-pad playing first person shooters on the PS1, why would the PS1 version of Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six ever even be considered for this collection? Why not? Even though with the death of Midway Williams, it would be a nightmare to relicense the custom PlayStation edition of Doom, or Duke Nukem, or even Disruptor, as I've heard some other channels suggest. I'm not even sure if the PS1 version of Rainbow Six was popular, or even if it sold that well to begin with. But I do attribute its inclusion as another case of reverse popularity. Not that the Rainbow Six series is in the popular graces in today's gaming world, but the modern shooter certainly is. Uh, the only thing I could think of is Sony is trying to appeal to the mainstream Call of Duty crowd by adding Rainbow Six to this collection. It's no secret that on the PC end of gaming, games like Delta Force, Operation Flashpoint, Rainbow Six, and Ghost Recon helped popularize the tactical slash modern shooter. And I think that Rainbow Six's addition is an homage to the genre's roots. I don't own the original on the PS1, the only console version of it I own is the Dreamcast version, which plays great despite its overly complicated controls. But from my experience with Rogue Spear on the PS1, if the original is similar, you'll find a surprisingly playable, yet glitchy and unspectacular version of Rainbow Six. Certainly not the best choice, not the best choice by a long shot, but playable. Twisted Metal. This is another huge head scratcher. Of all the Twisted Metal games people expected, they expected it to be Twisted Metal 2 instead of the original. My personal Twisted Metal experience is with owning the second one for over two decades, and it was the only Twisted Metal game I owned during the PS1's lifespan. I have since acquired the original, but have only booted it up maybe three times over the years, and I'm really, really bad at this game. Maybe I just need to get good at the original game to appreciate it more but Twisted Metal 2 would have easily been the best choice. That being said, the original is still a quality game, even if I am completely terrible at playing it. Wild Arms. I have owned this one for a number of years, but haven't put any substantial amount of time into it since I rented it back in the 90s. As you may imagine, owning almost 50 RPGs for the system, plus many more for other systems, my RPG backlog carries a crushing weight behind it. Wild Arms is a pre-Final Fantasy VII RPG on the PlayStation, and a solid one from what I remember of playing of it. Suikuden and Vandal Hearts are probably my two favorite pre-Final Fantasy VII RPGs on the PlayStation 1, but Wild Arms is definitely a good addition. It's the first game in a very long-running series, and I'm happy to see it get some love for its fans. Are there other RPGs I would have preferred to see in its place, like Grandia, Tales of Destiny, or even strategy RPGs like Final Fantasy Tactics, Vandal Hearts, or Tactics Ogre? Yes. But Wild Arms is still a solid addition. And there you have it. That's my rundown of the games on the PlayStation Classic. The real question is, am I personally going to buy one? I do own a majority of the games on the system already. My answer is, I'm actually tempted to pick one up. It comes down to Persona, Intelligent Cube, and even Mr. Driller for me and even those games I already own are still good for a playthrough. And it's easier access than having to dig through a tub of over 200 PS1 games to find the games I already own in the system. 
I don't keep any consoles in my living room as I have a separate gaming slash YouTube room and the PS1 Classic would be perfect to keep out in my living room as an easy plug and play retro box that has easy access to a number of games. At this point I'm actually leaning towards picking one up. If you have no interest in picking up a PlayStation Classic, it's understandable as the game selection is far from perfect, and even if the system had 20 games we all wanted to see, you really can't sum the PS1 up with 20 games. No matter what the list, there will always be disappointed gamers. I know some people are interested in the hackability of the system, but personally I could care less about that. Overall, I would say the Bottom line is, what the PlayStation Classic offers is good but not great, at least the North American version, because the Japanese version has a different and arguably better selection. Granted, I didn't feel the need to cover the Japanese one because this video is already long enough. Why did mom give you the silver? I, I was supposed to get the Where silver. Where were you when mom was sick? Oh, that's right. Excuse you were me. in Florida with that Don't guy. Don't talk to my wife that way. Talk to me way I want to. Excuse, Excuse me. me. You know, you're not even I've got, got relatives. Like I've got to say, I think I want to be a Democrat. Okay, time out. Fangs and claws away. Peace on earth. Goodwill to each other. Where's the law? You can't stop, Grandma. <laughs> you can't. PlayStation. <laughs> Thank you.